So welcome everybody, both people in the room and people online uh, to this seminar, which is jointly sponsored by the Precision Medicine Resource of the uh, Irving Institute for Clinical and Translational Research, Columbia's CTSA program, uh, and by the Center for uh, Research on the Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications of Psychiatric, Neurologic, and Behavioral Genetics, a program here at Columbia in the Department of Psychiatry funded by uh, the National Human Genome Research Institute. Uh, we're delighted this month to welcome Kyle Brothers. Uh, Kyle is uh, the Chief Scientific Officer for the Norton Children's Research Institute in Louisville, Kentucky, where he's also <clears throat> Professor of Pediatrics and Endowed Chair for Pediatric Clinical and Translational Research at the University of Louisville. Uh, Kyle also directs the Division of Pediatric Clinical and Translational Research uh, at the university. He is a pediatrician and bioethicist by training. Uh, Kyle uh, got his MD at the uh, University of um, Louisville School of Medicine, completed his pediatric uh, residency training at uh, Vanderbilt, uh, and uh, at Vanderbilt as well, received his PhD in the Department of Religion with a focus in their program in ethics and society. Uh, his uh, work has uh, focused heavily on the ethical issues and the translation of genomic technologies uh, to clinical practice. He's also a practicing primary care pediatrician and serves as a clinical ethics consultant at the Norton Children's Hospital, which is affiliated with the University of Louisville. Uh, and uh, Kyle's talk today uh, will focus on expanded newborn screening through genome sequencing and LC perspective. And we're delighted to have you here in New York and, and to welcome you to Columbia, Kyle. Thank you so much, Paul. That was a very kind introduction. Um, it's really great to be here. I was uh, telling my colleagues here, um, this is my first time in New York City, so I've uh, really uh, enjoyed the visit, both to meet the people here at Columbia, uh, see some old friends at Columbia, and uh, explore the city, so it's been wonderful. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be talking today about uh, the idea, the proposal, the plan to expand newborn screening through the use of genome sequencing. And um, I've called this an ELSI perspective. And for those of you not familiar with the term ELSI, it's short for ethical, legal, and social implications. Um, it's sort of a field of its own. And uh, it's a field that um, I share with a lot of my uh, Columbia colleagues here. So I wanted to start with a case. Um, Consider a male a baby discharged home at 36 hours of age, and uh, the baby received all of the standard newborn care, vitamin K shot, erythromycin ointment in both eyes, hepatitis B vaccine, screening for hyperbilirubinemia with a transcutaneous tool, um, labs, which include blood type and serum glucose, and a newborn screening blood spot card sent to the state lab. These are all routine parts of the first days of life of infants <clears throat> born in hospitals. Two weeks later, the parents are both still on parental leave. And uh, as many parents are at this stage, they're struggling with breastfeeding just a bit. The mother's not slept for more than three hours straight in the two weeks since they've had the baby home. And uh, they receive a call from a nurse at their pediatrician's office saying something was found on the newborn screen and they need to schedule an appointment. <clears throat> At the appointment, the pediatrician explains that the state lab found a genetic change indicating the child is at risk for developing autism and developmental delay. And there's a referral center about two hours away. So the pediatrician sort of organized a telemedicine visit with a genetic counselor uh, relatively quickly and then a follow-up in person with a neurogeneticist at a later, a later date. 
So uh, this part of the story is a little bit in the hypothetical stage right now, um, but quickly approaching. And so this talk is really thinking about what does this look like? What are the, the challenges that we might encounter with this type of thing? And uh, just thinking through some of those issues. So I'm uh, actually gonna talk about four uh, deeply interrelated issues. The first one is selecting appropriate targets. So basically if we're using uh, genomic technologies in the newborn screening phase of life, uh, what should we be looking for? Um, thinking about managing off-target results, uh, which as we'll discuss is a little bit of a funny topic for newborn screening. Um, thinking about informed consent in this context, and then uh, probably the most important topic, uh, equity. So we're going to start with selecting appropriate targets. Um, I suspected that uh, many of the uh, members of the audience will not be like deeply uh, knowledgeable of like what happens in the newborn screening space. So I thought it would be helpful to explore um, a little bit about how this thing goes um, in today's world. So um, HRSA, which is the Health Resources and Services Administration, it's part of the Department of Health and Human Services, has an advisory committee on heritable disorders in newborns and children. Um, full disclosure, I currently serve on this uh, committee, but uh, only for a few more months. And um, this group maintains what's called the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel, <clears throat> the RUSP. I'll be using that abbreviation throughout the talk today. Um, this is basically uh, provides a scientific and, and other kinds of consideration review of proposed conditions to be added to the rest. And um, this comes out from the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services as a recommendation across uh, all of the states and territories for conditions that should be considered to be added. Um, however, the, the actual screening and the actual decision to add a condition uh, is made at the state level. And states, uh, as is the case in uh, many areas of, of public policy, have highly variable processes for adding conditions to their state panel. In some states, uh, there is a statute that uh, requires the state lab to add RUSP conditions within a certain amount of time after they are added to the RUSP. Um, so this is maybe the most intuitive approach and um, there's a lot of advocacy to try to get all the states pl playing the same uh, way. But there are um, some states that have delegated this type of decision to a state level committee, which might consider what the national group has done or might make other decisions on its own. And then there are some states that re require a new statute every time they're gonna add a new condition, uh, which as you could guess, probably doesn't work that well. <clears throat> so there's this uh, relatively involved process to get a condition added to uh, newborn screening. Um, most uh, states in their screening programs, I guess all states, um, use as a first tier test tandem mass spectrometry, um, which is sort of a biochemical methodology. It's a non-genetic, uh, non-molecular biology kind of technology and uh, or other kinds of biochemical testing. Um, these are basically looking at biomarkers that are not DNA. Okay, so that's um, kind of helps clarify what's going on there. Some states do use molecular tests or genetic tests as first tier. Um, for example, cystic fibrosis in some states, the first tier test is a genetic test. Um, but many states, many more states use molecular tests for confirmatory testing. So if they find uh, an out of range result on their first tier biochemical test, they will then send for the remaining portion of that sample for some type of genetic test, which then could provide confirmatory information. <clears throat> and then um, the advantage of using biochemical tests as opposed to molecular tests or genetic tests is that biochemical tests are thought to be more proximal to the signs and symptoms of a condition. So uh, you can sort of have risk for a condition genetically but biologically, you don't have that condition. And biochemical tests are really a much uh, closer way to measure whether a person actually is experiencing a condition at that moment. And um, if the right test is used, biochemical tests can be highly specific and sensitive 
So um, this is, you know, a reason that state programs prefer these kinds of tests because the high specificity and sensitivity is really what state programs need. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is. <clears throat> I do want to give, give you a little window into the RUST process because I think it's really helpful in thinking about adding conditions in the future, including things like autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. So um, this, uh, dis the decisions from the rest, they're based on the committee composition. So there is some play over time about what kinds of things count uh, as good justification for adding a condition. But the group as a, uh, as a whole is typically highly conservative. And uh, I, what I mean by that is that they expect evidence that um, false positives and false negatives would be very low in newborn screening for a condition, that uh, there, there is confirmatory testing available that could really help clarify whether a patient actually has a condition or will have the condition, or um, maybe it's just like sort of borderline case, or maybe doesn't have the condition and has like a pseudo condition, which is there's some markers that look like they might have the condition, but they don't actually, they're not going to develop symptoms. Um, and there's uh, probably the most important criteria is an expectation that not just that there is a treatment, but that early treatment outcomes are much better than treatment outcomes if you follow standard practice, which is typically children go through their normal preventive care. And if they develop symptoms and are diagnosed with the condition, then they start treatment. So the, this committee is typically expecting that you, there's uh, firm evidence that starting that treatment before symptoms develop is actually uh, provides measurable benefit for the uh, child. And then um, th because there's a number of steps along the way here where things could uh, go awry, false positives, false negatives, uh, treatments that carry burdens on their own, there's an ex expectation that this incremental benefit of early treatment over later treatment outweighs all the relevant risks, which is, a, again, a very hard thing to quantify, but it is what the committee is looking for. <clears throat> so the reason these stringent criteria do make sense is that um, if you take any test and you scale it up to being run on the entire population, any even a small percent of false positives and false negatives turns into a relatively large absolute number. So um, yeah, you can just think through, if you had a million babies born in a, in a region at any one year, the 1% of those, that's quite a lot of babies, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, state labs are, you know, typically, you know, uh, less than a dozen people probably. They uh, don't have unlimited resources. So uh, adding an unlimited number of conditions would really quickly use up all of the resources state labs have to do these tests, return them to uh, physicians and families, and uh, you know basically go through the whole process. Um, there's also a consideration that although it could be helpful to start treatment for a condition early, that might actually not be required in infancy, that early treatment could mean at age 12 or something like that. And so uh, there is theoretically, although in uh, many cases not from a practical perspective, but there is theoretically the potential for uh, enacting screening at other stages in a child's life that don't necessarily have to be done in infancy. Um, this uh, idea that treatment or that screening is compulsory is also a really, uh, is an issue that weighs heavily on this decision-making process. And functionally, it's not compulsory, but uh, in practice, most states use effectively an opt-out system um, in that they're sort of, this is what we do. Um, there maybe is not a lot of discussion about it. And then families, can, if they actively know about it and want to opt out, they may be permitted to do that. But uh, functionally, this ends up being the vast majority of families and some states it looks a little bit more like compulsory. So that, that does weigh heavily that when you're doing something that folks can't easily opt out of or give consent for, 
that uh, you really want to make sure that you feel quite confident what you're doing. It provides benefits that outweigh the harms. And then um, there's, there's some evidence on what it's like as a member of a family where the false positive result is returned. And then there's this process of getting the results back, probably not enough study of that topic, but there is a rec recognition that sort of pushing these families who have a child who literally has nothing wrong with them, but got a false positive result and kind of getting them into a medical system creates all kinds of drawbacks for them that are, you know, um, morally relevant. So um, <clears throat> just to give you some recent examples of how this plays out, uh, February 9th of this year, the um, advisory committee voted not to add CREB agencies to the rest. And um, although every committee member's decision is sort of like their own thing, the issues that were raised during the discussion were that the intervention, which is hemopoietic stem cell transplant, uh, bone marrow transplant effectively, is, um, is burdensome. It creates its own risks and the benefits are present, but that there's this uh, wane of the, bur of the burden and the benefits of this treatment um, does not lead to the conclusion that there is, you know, a uh, absolutely clear uh, benefit that outweighs any of the burdens. There's, uh, it's a little bit more of an ambiguous situation and people might evaluate that differently. Um, there's also uh, the very real risk that uh, folks could have sort of borderline cases and end up receiving a burdensome treatment, but um, actually that wasn't necessary because they were never going to develop the condition. And then um, it's not clear that in all states, the ability to get a hemopoietic stem cell transplant within four to six weeks, which is the recommended timeline for crab disease, that that could actually be achieved. There's only a few places in the country that offer this treatment <clears throat> for crab disease. The next day on February 10th, um, the committee voted not to move forward uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy for evidence review. So it didn't even get to the point where there was a vote whether to add it to the rest. They, uh, it was not even sent for review. And um, the reasons for this were there's very limited evidence on the incremental benefit of early treatment. It's clear that corticosteroids and uh, newer exon skipping therapies, which are sort of precision therapeutics for this condition, um, that they do provide benefit, but there was very limited um, evidence that the incremental benefit from early treatment was significant. Um, there's also, uh, there is confirmatory testing, uh, which is in this case, sequencing of the gene, but that sequencing technically is not FDA approved. Um, I put an asterisk here just because I'm not sure that was a major reason, but is a, uh, a fact. Um, and then there are definitely false positives and borderline positive uh, cases when screened for Duchenne, mus Duchenne, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And uh, it was perceived that the rates of that occurring would be uh, too high for a popu population scale screening. So um, I go through these examples and this recent, these recent decisions to really highlight how um, rigorous this process is and how um, fastidious it is in, in sort of identifying conditions uh, to be added to newborn screening. Um, there's also other concerns that aren't, you know, didn't come up in these cases, but there's off-target findings, which is if we screen for condition A, we're, we're unavoidably going to pick up condition B, regardless of whether or not that uh, is, you know, would qualify for newborn screening. Uh, there's a lot of concern about just distribution of limited resources. So, um, <clears throat> you know, if we spend a lot of effort to add new conditions, are we sort of uh, not leaving the resources to manage other kinds of, of challenges in the public health space. And then, um, you know, the potential for newborn screening either to address disparities or to exacerbate disparities, um, which is uh, I'm, a key issue I'm going to talk about in a little bit, but uh, also a factor that goes into all of this decision making. Um, I really want to point out, though, that the parents of children with conditions uh, 
that are not on newborn screening, but maybe could benefit from newborn screening, these parents are typically strong advocates for getting that condition on to the newborn screening panel, which implies that um, there are significant benefits that the, the parents perceive that are not being factored in maybe as directly as they could be into this decision-making process. So something to, to really uh, you know, be humble about, uh, which is if parents are pushing for condition to be added to newborn screening, what is it that they see that's so important that maybe is, you know, is not being accounted for in these earlier cases that I've been talking about. Okay, so uh, uh, along the way here, I'll highlight some take home messages. And uh, so I think this section is really the current newborn screening is highly parsimonious. And there are some very good reasons for doing that. But uh, I think an important question for us to consider is how should we apply those concerns to genomic newborn screening? And are there, is, are there elements of this sort of decision-making process that we should rethink in light of the idea of using sequencing for newborn screening programs? Okay, so uh, I told you all of that to tell you this. Um, when we're thinking about incorporating sequencing into newborn screening, and we're thinking about how to select appropriate targets, there's certainly the possibility of using sequencing to just identify conditions that have already been added to the rest. And that would typically not need to be reevaluated by the advisory committee or by states. They, um, the, recommendation to add a condition to newborn screening is about the condition, not about the lab technology. So states could implement next generation sequencing as a first tier test if they decided it would improve screening performance. So they could do that tomorrow, it just depends on uh, cost and the incremental value of doing that. Um, so that's, you know, in some ways uncontroversial. There are also a number of conditions that are very much like those currently on the rust, in that there are treatments available, such as dietary interventions and enzyme replacement therapy, other kinds of precision therapeutics that are being used. There are a number of conditions that can be treated by hemopoietic stem cell transplant. So, uh, so there are a lot of conditions like that that are not currently on the rust, um, but they you know, are uh, diagnosable with with next generation sequencing. And I thought I would just give you a few, uh, uh, just a glimpse here of some of the programs that are going on to explore the incorporation of those kinds of conditions um, and sort of piloting them using sequencing. So um, there's a program called Early Check. Uh, it's run by RTI, the Research Triangle Institute, along with some partners in North Carolina. And um, they currently are only doing DMD. I think they have plans to expand that. They have, um, in that case, they use uh, creatine kinase as the first tier test, which is a biochemical test, and then sequencing as a second tier test. And um, they have previously done Fragile X and spinal muscular atrophy. There's also Screen Plus, which is uh, done by the neighbors of our uh, the host here. And um, they're doing a number of conditions. If you go through this list, a number of them are in the same class as conditions that are already on the rest. There are a lot of similarities between these conditions. And this is essentially a pilot to find out what are the outcomes of doing these kinds of conditions in newborn screening? What would that look like? And um, for the most of these, the first tier test is biochemical, the second tier test is sequencing. And then uh, Columbia, our uh, colleagues here, are doing a program called Guardian. And uh, this is an expanded newborn screening study of over 250 conditions, group one in, in which treatment is available, and then group two, uh, which is optional uh, for participants to uh, look at conditions where there's no specific treatment identified. And this uh, program uses genomic sequencing as, a, as the first tier test. Okay, so for me, conditions like those currently on the rust, um, I really you know, think these would function very similarly to the, the way things have gone in the past. The advisory committee 
requires outcomes for early treatment. So these newborn screening pilots are really critical to develop that evidence base uh, and create the possibility that these things could be added to the RESP in the future. Then, so we're now getting more into the space of things that are controversial. Um, there are conditions that have non-medical interventions. And uh, uh, an example that's not really diagnosed by sequencing, but has been nominated in, in the past and is worth thinking about as an example is congenital cytomegalovirus infection um, in which the, the response to a positive screen in an asymptomatic patient is frequent audiology follow-up and when needed implementation of speech therapy and cochlear implant or other kinds of interventions for deafness. And so you really start to see um, there's some subtle differences between these conditions and these other conditions that have more medical kinds of interventions. And for many of these conditions, uh, early treatment would be things like physical therapy, occupational therapy, special education, starting uh, therapies like ABA earlier in the, in the process. And so most neurodevelopmental conditions, including autism, would be in this category. Um, so let's just think about the neurodevelopmental conditions and sort of where they fit into thinking about newborn screening. Uh, typically, these uh, it's not possible to cure or change the overall disease course. Um, and that's in some ways why they feel different. Um, but there is good reason to think that early intervention, for example, starting even in infancy before a child is even symptomatic, they, that should improve outcomes. There's a lot of um, indirect evidence that implies that's the case. Um, but demonstrating that with you know, a firm evidence base is likely to be extremely difficult, uh, given that many of these conditions are rare individually, that uh, really to find out if that treatment is effective, there would need to be long-term follow-up. And um, there, there could be difficulty in identifying what the outcomes are that we want to measure in order to determine whether uh, the intervention actually it provides an incremental benefit over later intervention. Um, and so thinking about the dynamic here, if such evidence uh, you know, of, of clear demonstration of benefit of early treatment over a later treatment, if that remains a requirement, then certainly the only way we'd ever be able to get these conditions added to newborn screening is through pilot studies. Um, another feature which I think is really important to consider um, and which I've learned a lot about from my colleague here at Columbia, Maya Rudolph, is that um, experiences like, I'll just talk um, we were talking about SNL earlier. Um, experiences like uh, deafness and autistic features um, are often not considered to cause suffering. And so they are, could be thought of as a, within the spectrum of the normal human experience. And so um, when we're thinking about the implications of early intervention, uh, the outcomes could be highly variable. And we're even thinking about outcomes which include what many would consider within the spectrum of normal features. So um, as a result, there, there's gonna be no, numerous choices and approaches to therapy. There's gonna be measuring of outcomes that are it's more challenging. So really you could get into some complexity here. Um, so is direct evidence of incremental benefit from early detection a standard we should adhere to in future arrests or state decisions? And I'm just giving you a few of the issues. There are numerous other issues here. Many of these are gonna have higher false positive rates. Um, they're gonna have uh, borderline positive rates where sort of folks are in a, a more of a, a middle state between uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic. Um, there's going to be a longer path to confirm the diagnosis. This is the case for congenital CMV infection, but also for many of these neurodevelopmental conditions. Um, I think there's a lot of work going on to identify whether children earlier in life have autism symptoms and other kinds of neurodevelopmental symptoms. But um, typically these days, you're turning these things up at 18 months of age or 24 months of age. There's really a longer path 
you're not picking these things up within the first month of life. Okay, that, that was selecting appropriate targets. So let's move on to managing off-target results. Um, so uh, someone, I can't, now I can't remember who pointed this out but to me, but in newborn screening, everything is either a secondary finding or an incidental finding, right? Um, we talk about secondary findings as the results that you might uh, look for when doing sequencing, even though that's not a thing that would cause the symptoms that the child is having. So a genetic change that would cause the child symptoms, that's a primary finding. Uh, a change that's called could cause some other kind of condition is a secondary finding. And then incidental findings are those that you um, are not looking for them, but you can't avoid discovering them. So um, the American College of Medical Genetics maintains this, what's called the minimal list or secondary findings list. Um, I also serve on this committee, full disclosure. And um, basically the evaluation is if uh, a patient is getting exome sequencing or genome sequencing at, for a diagnostic purpose uh, to, uh, to identify the cause of the symptoms that they're experiencing, what are the other things that because we're generating this data, we should actually go out and look for in the data. Um, so this list includes cancer phenotypes, uh, cardiac phenotypes, arrhythmias, cardiomyopathies, inborn errors in metabolism, uh, typically not uh, inborn errors in metabolism that are symptomatic during the neonatal period because the assumption is those will be picked up in the neonatal period and most of the sequencing is taking place later. And then there's a miscellaneous category which includes MODI, which is a type of diabetes, uh, hereditary hemochromatosis, et cetera. So um, in this decision-making process for determining what kinds of secondary findings should be looked at if you're generating the data anyway, um, the standard is effectively, what are the conditions that where there's something could be done pre-symptomatically that experts believe will improve outcomes? So um, the point here, which I think is on the next slide, is that we've got some decision-making processes about how we use, um, how, how we effectively screen either when a, a baby is a newborn or when we're doing diagnostic sequencing. And the process and the decision-making criteria there are very, very different. Um, and a key issue here is when it comes to evidence for benefit. So, um, the advisory committee looking at newborn screening expects a very high standard of evidence, uh, whereas you know the secondary findings is really more that there's a belief that by experts that something could be done. So um, uh, another just key issue in thinking about newborn screening and these ACMG minimal list conditions is there are two that are often referred to as adult onset conditions, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer and Lynch syndrome. Um, both of these are cancer predisposition uh, uh, syndromes. And uh, there's recent evidence that these genes might not be truly adult onset, um, although penetrance is low during childhood. Effectively, uh, children with these changes appear to have a slightly higher risk for, of cancer compared with children who don't have these changes, implying that there is some effect on risk for cancer during childhood. And um, the, the key thing to remember here for secondary findings is that when you're talking about secondary findings there, it implies that you're making a choice about whether to search and find those results, right? So it's not unavoidable, it's a choice to use the data you've already generated in order to look for something. So that uh, contrasts with incidental findings where you really uh, can't avoid finding these things. So earlier I called these off-target conditions. These are things, that's the language in newborn screening, essentially you know, pleiotropic genes that cause a disease that is on newborn screening. But also if you look at that gene, you're gonna find another condition that um, is, is different and maybe wouldn't qualify for newborn screening, but now you can't avoid finding it. And another common type of incidental finding when using sequencing is chromosomal differences uh, differences in sexual differentiation, et cetera. So um, 
these incidental findings, they're really not a reason not to use um, next generation sequencing and newborn screening, but um, the implication is simply that you have to know you're going to find them and have a plan for how to deal with that. Okay, LC challenges. Uh, next one is informed consent. I'm just gonna to touch on this quickly. Um, you're really thinking about very different consent frameworks when you're talking about a research pilot, uh, which is Guardian and other kinds of efforts that we talked about earlier, versus the actual strict state newborn screening programs in which, as I was saying earlier, it's not exactly compulsory, but it, the uh, heavy assumption is that every baby is going to get it. So um, if you think about newborn screening pilots in a research context, there is a potential for participation bias. And um, you know, if you just think about uh, identifying risk for autism during the newborn period, there might be families who know that they would struggle to process that information and use it effectively. They might say, I'm not gonna participate in research. And there might be groups that because of distrust in the healthcare system might decline to participate. So what you end up doing is you do research that provides false uh, reassurance that this is all gonna go well, right? And it's only when you expand it out to the entire population that you start to discover, oh, there are actually uh, families that are going to uh, have a bad experience with this process. So um, uh, and Nick Bodkin and some other, uh, Jeff Bodkin, I mean, and some other colleagues uh, have made a strong case for an opt-out in this kind of research because uh, if you have a uh, you know detailed consent process in which families really have a much higher likelihood of not participating then you lead to this maybe the research is not a very good simulation of the real world so therefore doing this kind of research with an opt-out um, makes a lot of sense the problem is many IRBs are not familiar with doing this kind of thing. And um, even though I think you could make a strong case, but it might be hard to get IRB approval for that. And then um, in you know, state newborn screening programs, both the population scale and the compulsory nature, as I was saying earlier, it implies this highly stringent level of evidence of benefit. But when we think about consent for expanded newborn screening in which you're now doing sequencing and looking for a lot more things. The question is, do we still meet that stringent level of evidence for benefit and we're therefore just gonna keep using the same process we've always used? Or are we gonna have a second kind of optional level of testing that people can sort of say, yeah, I'll, I get all the standard things and I'll, I'll take the extra. So I think there's a lot of questions about how we approach consent for expanded newborn screening. But a key issue and an issue that comes up every time you talk about a change to newborn screening is can the new thing, in this case, a second tier of testing, can that be implemented at a population scale without threatening the core mission of newborn screening programs, which is to make sure these conditions that are believed to, where early identification is believed to be highly beneficial to get that into the hands of every single baby, right? To benefit every single baby. Okay, which leads me to equity. Um, so equity in newborn screening is uh, uh, an issue of great concern. It actually um, was a founding motivation for newborn screening. Um, back in the early days of PKU, um, it was recognized some hospitals had adopted PKU screening and were identifying babies who have PKU who are now able to use the special diet and not develop um, developmental delays. And um, there was a concern that which hospital you were born in determined whether or not you would benefit uh, from this intervention. So uh, this is where the, the idea of universal newborn screening came about. And so really universality is itself a strategy for addressing equity, um, for, for addressing inequity. And, um, but that universality only applies to the very first step, which is the screening itself. Um, 
Most states also do a good job with the second stage of ensuring, uh, ensuring equity in the second stage, which is diagnosis, sort of we've identified a child who looks like they might have this condition, we're now going to diagnose them with it. That tends to go uh, well in, in most circumstances, although there are numerous failure points that could happen there. Um, but then downstream, there are all sorts of inequalities in um, the quality of medical care, access to the treatment that children might need, uh, access to expensive special diets, et cetera. So even though you have this first stage designed to address, uh, to, to bring about equity, the downstream effects might, uh, there might be uh, disparities introduced. So um, this is just an example kind of demonstrating uh, how newborn screening can address uh, inequity. So uh, there's this really great paper by Jeff Roscoe and some other colleagues uh, talking about uh, various evidence that newborn screening does in fact reduce health disparities. And this is one example that they give that um, SCID, which is uh, an, an immune condition, an immunodeficiency condition, um, for before the implementation of newborn screening in California, 80% of children who received uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplants or SCID, 80% of them were not Hispanic white. Um, after screening was implemented, only 13% were not Hispanic white, which I think you could uh, imply or you could uh, deduce here that before screening was implemented, there were tons of patients who were not non-Hispanic white who had skid but were not receiving the appropriate treatment for it. So clearly there is an opportunity here for newborn screening to be a mechanism to bring about equity. Another a great example, which is pretty straightforward to think through sickle cell and cystic fibrosis. Uh, most of us have in our head a, uh, a bias, a, a prejudgment about the risk of an individual for sickle cell or cystic fibrosis based on the race and ethnicity. Um, but in fact, we know there are numerous cases where children, because they were perceived to not be from the racial group, thought to be at risk for these conditions, actually went years and years and years without being identified, even though they had the appropriate symptoms and should have been easily diagnosed. But this uh, you know, persistent belief that race and um, ancestry are, go along with each other creates this inability to see these conditions in unexpected places. And so new, newborn screening now looks for both of these conditions and it creates an opportunity to identify these conditions uh, that is separate from the biases of healthcare providers who might not look for them. Okay, so universal newborn screening is a necessary but not sufficient step toward equity for infants with genetic conditions. So um, an important question to think about is what effect, if any, would adding first tier uh, next generation sequencing to newborn screening have on the universality of screening, the willingness of parents to participate and you know, not opt out of newborn screening, um, efforts to achieve equity in the downstream components of care. One argument that's been made is that um, the system of care <clears throat> utilized by children with genetic conditions, these are, there's not millions and millions of geneticists in the country, there's really a limited supply. And so these services are often saturated already. So if we expand newborn screening, do, would we run the risk of sort of clogging the system with lower risk children who are less likely to benefit from care and who are sort of taking up the slot of children who are higher risk and actually would benefit more from that care or is it the case that um, children currently being served by systems of care are less likely to be from underserved backgrounds um, so that newborn screening would actually help address, uh, even though it couldn't erase some of this inequity. So there's this kind of uh, push and pull here between uh, are we running the risk that expanding newborn screening would worsen inequities or do, is there a possibility they could actually help alleviate inequities? And I think, this is the kind of thing that is an empirical question that would really need to be answered empirically. Uh, 
Uh, so yeah, can't expand a newborn screening or a second tier of testing, which would in include next generation sequencing. Could either of those be implemented without threatening core, the core mission of newborn screening programs? Okay, so we're ready for discussion now. I thought it would be helpful for me to sort of put out what I think is uh, like where we should be headed here. And then maybe we can have some discussion on that. So um, really, I think it's clear newborn screening pilots of expanded uh, screening using next generation sequencing are really badly needed. And um, using an opt-out consent to minimize petition participation bias, I think is a really important uh, method that could be utilized if you sort of get everybody on board with using it. Um, it's critical that these pilots collect both clinical outcomes, that's the kind of data that's currently used to make decisions, but also patient-oriented outcomes about false positives, about what is the experience of needing to go for months to years, waiting for a, for a diagnosis to be confirmed, et cetera. You know, if you don't understand the, parent, the parent's uh, experience with this, you really don't understand what is happening. Um, and then all of these studies should have an explicit focus on equity and healthcare utilization in order to better understand uh, is expanding newborn screening going to create new inequities or is it going to help alleviate inequities? And um, I really think um, the, the Rust and state newborn screening programs, uh, they probably are pretty close to having the right mindset about what conditions should be added. But I would like to see maybe slightly less stringent criteria for adding conditions, especially, especially around evidence for benefits, simply because getting such evidence can be so difficult. Um, and then if, um, uh, if we implement uh, next generation sequencing, either in the first or second tier, we really need to implement that, not with the idea at the population scale that we're going to just do everything um, but rather that we design the approach specifically to suppress uh, secondary findings that don't meet our criteria. So we're not stumbling upon those results. We're choosing not to look for them because we understand that those uh, discovering them could actually threaten the, the core mission of newborn screening. Okay, so thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Paul, for having me. Thank you all for coming. So the floor is now open for questions. Those of you who are online can enter your questions in the chat and we'll, we'll pick them up from there. Um, let me see if, to start with if there's anybody in the room who um, wants to have, please. Um, so you mentioned something about um, some people don't consider things like deafness and autistic features to cause suffering, and it's just normal human experience. And I know that within the deaf community, they feel that it's not a disability, it's just something that's different about them. Right. Um, so it seems like people who have this point of view don't think that diseases that cause those things are not are things that we should be focusing on. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that or what should qualify as a disability or should we be focusing on these things? Yeah, I, I think they can't hear. Yeah, you may want yeah. to just briefly boost it. Yeah, so a really great question. You're actually sitting next to one of the national experts on this topic. The question is, uh, should we even consider some of these conditions that, in, that sort of could be included in you know, the normal experience of humanity um, as disabilities, as things that should be targets for newborn screening. And I actually think that that is um, a, a critical decision point for doing this kind of thing. I don't think we have a clear answer to that. Although as an example, I, uh, I certainly work with families in my own clinical care who have a child with autism in which it seems to me that the parents and the child are experiencing that as a form of suffering. Um, but as we know, autism is a spectrum and there are, I also know of families who have a child who has a diagnosis of autism that there's fundamentally nothing wrong with that kid, right? They uh, interact with the world in a way that's different. 
They do experience uh, challenges in the school setting and other places because, you know, uh, folks are not really uh, working with them in the way that they need to. Um, but there, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that kid, right? So um, the, the challenge is we view this condition as a spectrum. Uh, deafness, I think, is a, a little bit di different um, situation. Um, but how do we identify where uh, suffering is cut off? Like, where, how do we know when that's happening? And how do we decide how to utilize these tools in order not to mess with the people that have nothing wrong with them and to instead provide benefit for people who are suffering and we can alleviate that suffering. And um, we, uh, my Sabatella and I, we proposed uh, a process for thinking through that with some geneticists, um, the American Society of Human Genetics. And I think um, fundamentally, the, the only answer I can give you now is uh, it's not, we're not gonna do that by putting some doctors in a room and have them decide. Right, that's the wrong way to go. Um, but having people who uh, are labeled with autism, but who live uh, fulfilling lives, they need to be at the table. We need to have the parents of children and sometimes young adults and, and older adults with more severe kinds of autism that they are experiencing suffering. They need to be at the table too. Um, so I think there's a lot of, of work that needs to be done to sort that out. How was it? Was that okay? okay. <laughs> so we have a couple of questions on not from our folks online, and let me let me start uh, by reading the first of those. Uh, Giorgio Miroli says, "Great talk. I'm kind of new to the field, but I read that healthcare discrimination is among the reasons why people are skeptical towards these highly equitable programs." What do you think would help prevent healthcare discrimination by insurance companies while pushing forward with these programs? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, there's an ambiguity in the question, and I think it's great to keep the ambiguity there. There are multiple forms of discrimination, right? There is clearly uh, interpersonal bias in the interactions between healthcare providers and their patients. Um, there's also uh, genetic discrimination, which we think of as more of uh, insurance companies and other kinds of players engaging in that and not so much in an interpersonal way. Um, so I th there are maybe numerous policy uh, approaches that need to be taken. Um, uh, one simple policy approach would be to expand protections for genetic discrimination uh, to include other kinds of discrimination other than just what's covered under GINA. Um, but maybe even uh, more importantly, um, you know, is to continue to pursue, um, the, you know, a systemic change to bring about um, or to address the ways in which systems might benefit uh, some folks and not others. Um, yeah, I think. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Next question is from Josie Johnston, who's joining us from New Zealand. Uh, the UK's new pilot newborn sequencing program aims to enroll 100,000 infants. They have limited themselves to about 200 conditions. Do you have a view on this study and how it can be useful in the US context? Any thought on that study's um, use of community engagement? to develop principles for choosing conditions? Could that type of community engagement also work in the US? Yeah, I uh, don't know any details about the uh, program specifically. Certainly there are um, newborn screening pilots in this country that do use various forms of community engagement, having uh, parents and other stakeholders at the table and decision-making as part of the planning process, et cetera. I think, <clears throat> One way in which the US is quite different from the UK and many other countries is that our healthcare system is more, our you know, non-system is more fragmented. Um, whereas in the UK, it's possible to implement something at a much larger scale. So um, in the US, we're mostly talking about pilots that are implemented at the healthcare system level or at a state level in some circumstances. Um, 
So uh, I think, you know, uh, one direction that we really need to head is better coordination uh, between states, between healthcare systems to implement pilots um, because you really need 100,000 or more um, infants in order to get reasonable answers here. And um, again, I just want to stress, um, I think if you do have uh, members of the community and other stakeholders at the table, you're going to get pushed to and really need to be ready to measure the kinds of outcomes that are meaningful to parents, not just, uh, you know, these uh, medical things, but also the uh, experience of doing this. So, yeah. So, uh, Jess Giordano says, thanks for a great talk. I'm a prenatal genetic counselor leading genome sequencing research in pregnancy, and she specifies sequencing in non-anomalous fetuses. Do you think we should apply the same principles on reporting in the prenatal space as you shared for newborn, um, newborn screening, uh, genetic sequencing? And if not, what should be different and, and why? Yeah, that's actually a great question. I don't know if this question asker is in the US or not, but um, you know, those in the US probably know that um, we have a weird policy fence around reproduction. Um, obviously there's this ongoing- um, She's here at Columbia. Oh, okay. There's a, obviously a battle around abortion, but in every other element of reproductive healthcare, um, there is, you know, no one wants to put their hands on that. So the fertility space, um, for example, is uh, essentially unregulated. Uh, there, there are some forms of regulation, but essentially folks can do what they want. And um, so uh, do I think we should implement this kind of uh, careful thinking? Absolutely. I don't know that it would be exactly the same kind of decision making, but I, I could see uh, a lot more coordination to sort of recommend and, and uh, work towards, you know, more consistency. Um, but fundamentally, I think in the U.S., it's highly unlikely to happen just because the uh, lack of regulation in this space. And there's a lot of uh, commercial interests, which are kind of in competition. And so the the desire to offer more than the competitor is really strong. So I, I'm not sure that's really possible here. Right, so we are at the end of the hour. I wanna take a minute to thank all of you who joined us in person and those of you who are listening to us online. And of course, to thank Kyle Brothers, our speaker for a tremendously interesting presentation and, and discussion. So. Thank you very much.